here. Uh, I was supposed to be here a few months ago and couldn't make it. And uh, Pastor Tim made sure that uh, he gave me an, uh, another date and said, you better be there this time. <laughs> and so uh, I'm here. Uh, greetings from the sand, as um, your pastor just mentioned. Uh, it's uh, one of the largest private hospitals in Australia. And um, each day it's growing. and. Um, we have tremendous challenges, and our job as chaplains, uh, it's, we cannot really, in spite of all the qualifications or uh, educational trainings that we might have, uh, every visit that we make is different. So there is no particular set pattern to say, you go into this patient, you can do this and walk out. That's not what happens, and that is why uh, our job is a really challenging one, because each person is different. Each person has their own stories and uh, uh, people dealing with different situations in life. So uh, we, our, our style of chaplaincy is very unique compared to other hospitals because we go to every patient irrespective of faith or no faith, religious background or irrespective of any of those, we go to everybody and uh, we are with them in their journey and uh, we help them out in whatever part of their uh, life journey they are in. So uh, if you are interested in uh, uh, becoming a chaplain or want to study about chaplaincy or want to do some training, please feel free to contact us. And we also are looking for Adventist people who are interested in spending some time to give their time to us by coming to the hospital and visiting our patients. The truth is we have a volunteer program that we run. We have put them into all of the training and then they're in the wards, they visit, they come every week and visit the patients four hours a, a week, that's what, the, that's the time they're giving us. So it's, it's voluntary work, there's no pay, uh, but their commitment is amazing. The truth is that irrespective of how all the advertisements we send out asking for Adventist people to come to become our volunteers, very few Adventists that are. It's non-Adventists that are volunteers of the sand. And the ratio is really uh, very poor when it comes to uh, having Adventist people there. So whenever I, whenever I visit churches, I give this appeal, requesting them, if you have any time to spare, two hours a week, or three hours a week, or four hours a week, or even eight hours a week, please come, because our work will be more enhanced with your contribution because the hospital is growing, we are 600 plus beds, and we can't visit every patient that comes in, and so uh, we are, very, we are very, very, very thin. And that is why uh, Pastor Tim also has joined our team last year by the grace of Great Sydney Conference, so he comes there one day a week because just to help us out with the amount of work that uh, we are doing. So if you are interested and have some time for us, please. Uh, come and join our team. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for this afternoon. I want to thank you, Father, that uh, we could come together, spend some time in your presence. I want to thank you, Lord, that we can open up your word. And I want to thank you, Lord, that you are an, a God who is interested in each of our personal lives. And so, Father, we come into our lives into your hands. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless us with your Holy Spirit, that you would talk to us, that we will be able to listen to your voice, we'll be able to experience your love, and we'll be able to leave this place being blessed. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The story happened in the southern part of India. Several years ago, this man, he was a, 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 a landlord. And when I say landlord back in India at that time, it's not because uh, he had so much of money or, or something like that, but he had property, he had a land. And so uh, those days, how it worked is that people that are living around your, prop your, your land, your property, if they do not have farms and things like that, then they come and work in your farm. And so basically, uh, this landlord, he does not pay them daily wages or weekly wages or monthly wages. That, that's not how it works. You come and you work for this landlord, and then when it's harvest time, he shares the harvest with everybody. So that's what it, that's what happens. And then whatever is left over, then he sells it to the market, and he gets some money out of it. And then he also takes care of uh, all the needs in, in every uh, home of uh, his workers. So that is why he was known as a landlord in that place. 
a very strong Hindu extremist. As you know that our, India is a Hindu nation and the majority of the people are, are Hindus. And um, then comes Muslims and Christians are, I think, less than 8% from the 1.3 billion people in India. So uh, this man also was one of, uh, one of uh, the hardcore extremist Hindu. So when I say extremist, he does not like any other religion, that's what I mean. And so one afternoon after his lunch, he was having a siesta, and then all of a sudden his workers came to him and said, Hey, uh, Master, did you hear? that uh, this, there is this guy, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Christian guy. He's preaching in, 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 in our place, you know? He's, 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 he's conducting meetings and, 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 and something is going on there. He was so furious. He just commanded his men, get in the truck. And so they all got inside the truck and uh, the, the men knew their master so well. So they just simply did not go and get in the truck. They took, all what they could get in their hands, swords and knives and, and sticks, bamboo sticks and rods and whatever they could get, they just took it in their hand, all of them in the truck. And the landlord is sitting beside the driver and they took off. And they know what they're going to do because he just could not imagine that a Christian is preaching in his uh, village, not when he is one of the landlords there, a big shot there, so they, they were heading to literally kill this man. And instead of the truck coming down the road from the cliff, the driver lost his balance and the truck literally rolled down the cliff, down into the valley. And all these men who were in the truck, now there's no laws there, now here, if you can't have passengers in the truck, but they doesn't, they don't care about it. There's no seat belts or anything like that. They can stand, they can stand on top of the truck. They can be on top of the trains. They can be, they can do whatever they want, however you want to travel. But unfortunately, this was a, a bad accident. This landlord was thrown out of the truck in the process, and he went, he went flying deep down into the valley. And when the truck rolled down finally and came to a resting place, it was on his legs, the, the, trucks, the truck rested. Four days later, after this, it's a three, uh, three days later after this accident, he was in the small clinic back in those days, 1949, that's the time I'm talking about, and they didn't have any great medical facility, and he was on, this, on the floor with, um, some herbal treatments and all that happening and uh, the floor would have uh, been literally with uh, uh, blood and medicine and all kinds of things and uh, in came this missionary who was preaching, the preacher that was preaching in that village. He walks into this clinic and literally sits down on that dirty floor beside this landlord and spoke very few words. He said, I'm sorry that some of your men died in that accident. But I'm here to tell you that we are praying for you. You will live. We are praying for you. And then he didn't say anything else. It was silence. And after some time, the missionary just got him. And he walked away. A few days after that visit, the landlord tells his men, carry me to that place. I want to listen to what this guy is preaching. Can you take me there, please? So all his men carried him to this place where the missionary was preaching. And back in those days, the evangelistic series was not one or two days. It used to be like 40 days, 50 days where the missionary comes and, and literally they preach all the doctrines and they preach all the topics that they need to cover and by the time they leave that place, a church is established. So for 29 days from that first day that this man was taken, carried to this meeting, for the next 29 days, he was carried every night, night after night to this meeting. And the last day, it so happened, was a Sabbath day. 
the last day of the evangelistic series, and the pastor said, how many of you would like to be baptized and become Christians? The first one to put his hand up was this landlord. He put his hand up, and he told all his men, put your hands up. <laughs> so they all put their hands up. And so they were able to establish a church. <coughs> He could not be baptized because his legs were that bad. He, he couldn't be immersed in the water. So the missionary told him, sorry, you, you cannot be baptized today in this condition that you are in. But he was a very adamant man. He was a stubborn man. He said, you baptize me today or not, I'd never get baptized. He was very strong with what he wants, very strong will. And so they took him into the water, into the river, and they baptized his body, but not his legs. So when I get to heaven, I have a question to ask God. I'll ask him, how is it that my granddad is here, but his legs are not baptized? <laughs> that, that's what they, they, they did, because they couldn't, they couldn't baptize his legs. But he was so passionate about ministry, about Christ. And so he became a Christian, and all of a sudden he went back, he went to uh, uh, thousands of kilometers away to, to study theology because he wanted to know about this God, more about this God. And then he studied theology and then came back after three months, and instead of continuing as a landlord of that place, he became a pastor there. Can you imagine that? He became the pastor of that church. And uh, he continued in his ministry as a pastor and uh, became the conference leader. And uh, so uh, all his life he gave to, to pastoral ministry. And whenever I read the scripture, I also think about uh, when I read this particular scripture and uh, when I uh, read about Joshua, I often get carried away to my granddad's story because every time I, he sat down and told me the story, it was so passionately that he spoke, spoke about it. His heart was in it and uh, he was so passionate about Christ and Christianity that uh, anyone who would just talk to him would say, hey, I too want to be a Christian. And I see also lots of similarities between my granddad and, 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 and the, the character Joshua. There's lots of similarities. His temperament, his quick to act. And Joshua was very similar to He did the same thing. And when, you, when Pastor Tim told me, can you share some of your uh, experiences in life, your, your life story, and also take the two sessions here, I, I told him, yes, I would. So I thought, well, this is uh, something that I often think about, so I can blend these two characters together and find those similarities that I saw in my granddad at the, at the same time, similarities that in, are in the scriptures in the life of Joshua. I'm quoting Exodus chapter 17. Where, uh, uh, you know the story, very familiar story. I'm, 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 I'm looking at two stories of Joshua here uh, to bring out some lessons that are very uh, parallel uh, to our lives, and at the same time, I see some similarities with my granddad's life too. So, Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. Now, you know the story that uh, God told Moses and Aaron to be on the mountain top. And uh, Joshua, as you know how he is, he was uh, always uh, an aggressive person, a warrior, a fighter, a very courageous person, one who would just, at the, at the drop of his hand, he's ready to fight. You agree with me? Yes, so that, that's the kind of a guy he was. Joshua is relentless and oddly enough, the very thing that makes him a, a leader would almost like get him, got him killed. That's the kind of a guy he is. It is, isn't it amazing how your greatest strength in the wrong place can become your greatest weakness? Do you agree with me? Have you felt it at times? Sometimes your greatest strength in the wrong place can become your greatest weakness. And that was the case with Joshua too. He would just be ready for anything. The hardest thing in the world is to balance what is man's responsibility and what is God's responsibility? In other words, 
who does what. Have you ever come into that side, come into a situation like that? To balance what is God's responsibility and what is your responsibility? I remember a few years ago of this horrific phone call, call that I got from my wife. She was in the Philippines and uh, she called me and, uh, and uh, said, hey, there was an earthquake and everything is destroyed and I don't know how much I can talk to you because once the battery dies, that's it, you can't communicate with me. I was like, really? <laughs> and, and then for the next 24, 38 hours, there was no communication and I was traveling from Sydney all the way to the Philippines and uh, the project that we were working on establishing an orphanage and uh, getting this building up and having um, established as, as an orphanage and a destitute home for women in rehabilitation, women who are abused and, and are going through difficulties. So it, it's, a, it's a massive project and a project that we were so passionate about and we put our hearts in and uh, I was going all out because that was uh, my wife's uh, life passion. And so I thought, okay, we're doing the right thing, and, and this is what God wants us to do. But all of a sudden, when I reach there, and I'm seeing this building that's literally almost every wall that is cracked or broken down, and just standing on the pillars of the house, I, I was wondering, now, what, what is my role here? I thought we were doing the right thing. I thought we were establishing this charity uh, organization and we were doing it for the people, we were doing it for children, we were doing it for people who were in need and all of a sudden everything has come broken down, an earthquake. And there are moments when you question it and say, now what is my responsibility and what is God's responsibility? And one lesson that I learned there in that yeah, there are often times I didn't try to tell my wife any of those negative thoughts that are creeping into my mind because I'm laying there thinking, man, it was hard enough to, to get this going all this while and it is still hard to keep it running. And now, if I have to rebuild this place, where am I going to get the money? And I'm thinking, like, okay, I, maybe I should slowly tell her, no, this is not what God wants us to do. And uh, keeping all these thoughts in my mind and trying my best to see how it's going to all play out. And I was listening to her story where she's telling me, she's not worried about, she's not talking about any of these worries that I'm having, but it's she's saying how God protected her and how God protected the kids and how God uh, literally made provision, provision, provision for her even in spite of all these uh, the, the earthquake and, the, and, and everything broken down and, and she's talking about how she went and bought watermelon uh, the night before the earthquake and the, the guy who was selling the watermelon was uh, watermelons were wanted to go off to a different island so she was bargaining with him uh, on, on, the, on the price and uh, uh, the guy said alright if, uh, if you take all of this then I will give it to you for the price that you're asking and she said fine so she took all his watermelons and put it in the car and came home. But since it was evening, she said, all right, I'll leave it in the car for tonight. Tomorrow I'll take it in. So when the earthquake happened in the morning and they did not have any food to eat for the rest of the day and for the days, she remembered, oh, there's watermelon in the car. So she's telling me the story and I'm thinking like, telling myself, oh, you of little faith. You are one with more faith than, 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 than me, who is not, who is talking about only the good things that the Lord has done in spite of, of difficulties. But there are often times when, when we as people, as ordinary human beings, we ask this question, what is my responsibility? What is God's responsibility? In Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, to, uh, verse 30 to 15, the scripture is talking about now when Joshua was near Jericho. Now this is again another story about Joshua. He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Now Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Now this is again a familiar story. He's going to conquer Jericho. And uh, on that way to go conquer Jericho, that's when he's seeing this man. And uh, he did not recognize God. You know, recognizing God in the battle is very important. But he did not really, Joshua did not recognize God. How about your lives and my lives? How about our battles that we face? 
our battles in life. Have you recognized God in your battle? Or are we in a situation like Joshua where we have everything except God? He was very confident. Joshua was very confident. He was very sure that I am this, the best that Moses and his men have I had. I am the best uh, our, uh, soldier. I can go to do any battle. I am the very best. He's confident. Self-confidence is good. But sometimes overconfidence may not be that good. But this guy is so confident in him, so he knows that he can do it. And so he is ready. Yeah, Jericho, that's fine. That's it just out of the battle for me and he's almost forgotten what Moses had told him Moses God instructed Moses when Joshua comes after de defeating the Amalekites you better tell him what exactly happened on the mountain top you remember that statement the statement where the scriptures where God says tell this to Joshua because he doesn't know he was literally in the battleground fighting but he had no idea that when Moses stretched his hands out he was winning the battle. When his hands got tied, and when he dropped his hand down, Joshua was losing the battle. And so what happens? They literally helped Aaron, uh, helped to put his hands, outstretch his hands, and they said, even they took a stone to keep on his, so that his hands outstretched wide, because it was a clear indication and a sign from God that it is God that's giving them victory in the battle. But Joshua doesn't know any of that because he is down there in the valley fighting. And so God is instructing Moses, when Joshua finishes the battle and come, you tell that fellow what exactly happened. Why? Simply to bring his pride down. He should not think that it is because of his abilities, because he's the best fighter, and because he's the best uh, commander, he's the best army chief, that he can, uh, he can win this battle. And then he goes again to Jericho, just like how he is. That's his personality. His personality is that he, you tell him we need to fight, he's ready. He's ready to go for it. But when, when, when you are doing new things, God keeps showing up in new forms. When you are doing new things, God keeps showing up in new forms. <coughs> new challenges are a sign of progress. New challenges are a sign of progress. God shows up in new ways. Do you believe that? God shows up in different ways. God shows up in new ways. God shows up in ways that we cannot comprehend. People like to wander around a mountain that's safe than to have an ongoing experience with God. People don't like change. That's a fact. They like to have something that, is, that they know so well that they are feeling secure about. You've got to face new challenges. And that is why prayer is important. A prayer life is important. When you feel insecure, when you are vulnerable, that's the time when you have a better prayer life. Do you agree with me? There was this lady, I was called to, uh, we work on 24 into 7, in the sense, every day of the week, it's, it's a working day for us, and, and the night is working uh, nights for us too. So we are someone who will be always available at the sand from our chaplaincy department. So one night I was on call and I was called to the emergency. Um, so once you call the emergency, you know that there's something really uh, going wrong there. So when, when I went there, I'm just checking the time because the pastor told me that I need to finish by three. So just making sure Probably he won't call me next time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I went to emergency and uh, they told me that uh, this young man, he just turned 50 and um, he's here with a massive heart attack. Uh, don't know if he's going to make it. And they said, most likely he's going to die. So, it was left to the chaplain to wait for his wife to come to the hospital and his family and share the news with them. And so I was standing by the door and waiting for his wife and here comes this lady uh, just straight from work and she's uh, uh, coming with such a joyous smile and because she had no idea what's going on here, they just told her that your husband is in the sand, please come to the sand. 
And uh, she comes thinking that well, her husband is one of the strongest guys ever. Like, you know, he's a very healthy man. Nothing bad can happen. Maybe he had to, you know, he had to go to the sand for some checkup or maybe a cold or a cough or, you know, maybe uh, something. She's never thought about anything more than that. So here she comes smiling and so, so happy and uh, I introduce myself. She says, oh, okay, that's nice to, oh, you were waiting for me? I said, yes. And she still didn't get it why I'm waiting here. And um, she kept talking and then when I took her to the quiet room and I told her to sit down and I offered her some, I said, do you want to have a drink? And then I'm coming to the matter and then her face changed. She said, is everything okay? And so I had to tell her, I had to share the news. So I shared the news and then she says, of all days, it was, today's the only day I did not kiss him goodbye when he went left to work because he was getting late and I was in the shower and he just shouted from the outside there, uh, I'm leaving. So I said, yeah, well, go ahead. And it was the only day, not every morning I kiss him before going to work. That was her instant reaction. And then it was shock and sadness and, and she went on and then I asked her, uh, can I inform, who, who else is there in the family? And she said she has four kids, three boys and a girl. So I informed them all and they were all rushing to the hospital and um, she kept asking me, can I see my husband? But almost for uh, an hour and a half to two hours, uh, I had to keep telling her every time, no, because the doctors are working on her, on him, trying to revive him and trying their best to save his life. So again, when she says, can I see him? And by the time all the kids were there, and the in-laws were there and all that. And so I went to the doctor and said, hey, is there any possibility to, um, that they can see him? And the doctor said, oh, we're actually rushing him to the, for a scan. So I came back and told the family, they're actually taking him to the scan for, for a scan. And she said, oh, where is it? I said, it's down the corridor, the other side of the building. Oh, can we go there? And I said, we can go near, but we can't, you can't go into the scanning room for sure. You can't see him. So she said, that's fine. I just I want to know that I'm near my husband. Please take me to the scanning area. So I said, all right. So we all walked there to where the scanning takes place. And uh, we went there and we were standing outside the corridor of that particular radi radiology section. And uh, as we were standing there, she tells me, when I was 13, I left my family, I left the church, I was brought up as a you know, Catholic and uh, I was a Christian, of course, so at 13, I left everything. And uh, you know what? I never needed God. So I know you guys believe in uh, God and you guys pray and you know, uh, but I never needed God all this time. And then she continued saying, uh, uh, what do they call you? I said, Steve. Uh, no, 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 but what do they call you? So, like, she's r r going back to her roots where she knows. So, I knew what she's uh, hinting at again. So, when she asked me the third time, I said, Just call me Steve. She said, No, 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 but there's a term, right? Father? I said, Yeah, I'm a father of a few kids, but you don't have to call me that. <laughs> so, I've, she insisted, and I said, You can call me Pastor. Okay, Pastor. I know you guys pray. Can you pray? I said, sure. I was about just taking some time, giving her time. Is she really, does she really want to pray or what she wants to pray? And I was just taking it very slow. And then she said, oh, Pastor, wait, wait, wait. Kids, everybody come here. So they're, they're not kids, they're grown up, they're adults, you know. And the, the three boys and the, and the the daughter and the uh, boys are there with their uh, partners so they were all about seven eight of them there and she called everybody and she said pastor is going to pray they had no idea what prayer is they were like looking at each other and the mom has never talked about prayer and so okay now they're all here and I'm getting ready to pray and then she says wait a minute come let's hold hands so now we are standing in front of the scanning room where her husband is being I'm going to the scan. And we are in this corridor there holding hands. And so I'm going to begin prayer and then I was about to start and she said, no, wait, wait, wait. Let's all kneel down. So here we are. <laughs> we are all on our knees in a circle there and we are praying. I wrote an article about this later and I entitled it A Moment Photographed by God because I'm sure that God would have photographed that moment <laughs> having a group of people in front of the scanning room praying. But the need for her to say, let's pray, 
And a week later, I walked into a room in, in the cardiac ward, and there was this man sitting on the bed, and he, I went and introduced myself, and I said, I'm so and so, and she, he said, oh, you are the one my wife talks about. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I don't know who your wife is. She talks about me. <laughs> so, and he said, oh, you've got to wait. You've got to wait. My, my wife, is, she's, in the, she's in the restroom. She said, you've got to wait. So I was, I had no idea who this person is. And then the wife comes out and I recognize, oh, okay. She comes running and she just comes and holds me and gives me this, the longest hug. And she was in tears. And then she said, if they didn't bring him here, she's meaning the, the paramedics, if they didn't bring him here, he wouldn't have been with us today. It could mean many things, but what I took from there was that it, she meant, if you were not here, maybe she meant if you did not pray for, for him, if you did not say that prayer when we pray in front of the scanning room, when we were on our knees, you know, it's times of difficulties when we really think about, uh, about praying and uh, turning our thoughts to the Lord. Uh, the book of Exodus chapter 7 verse 11 says, as long as Moses held his hands up. So again, Joshua was winning when Moses was holding his hands up, but uh, he had no idea about it. Getting God to choose a sign. Now here he is, after that story, had just, he had just experienced that, and Moses had told him about it, and God told him to tell us these things, and here he is encountering a second battle, and all of a sudden he's seeing this man with a drawn sword, and he's asking him, are you on my side, or are you on the, the, the other side? You belong to the enemies. So it is almost like telling God, you choose which side you are. Getting God to choose a sign. That is what Joshua was doing there. There is something right in most ungodly person and some weakness in the most spiritual person. Do you agree with me? It is a balance between the sacred and the secular. That is the balance that we are talking about. That's the balance that, that uh, we are trying to find. Joshua did not know what Moses was doing on the mountaintop. He had no idea. He was confident in his skills. He was courageous. He was willing to fight. And so that is what, what he, he, he knows to do best. And so he will do anything and he doesn't really care about anything else. You are fighting because your past has shaped how you see your present. You're fighting because your past has shaped how you see your present. We all have stories. We all have life experiences. And often, our past is what really shapes how we think, see things currently. How we see things in the present, in the present life. It is our past that often dictates. Your perspective of who you are is based on who you have been. A prejudged disposition based on past experience about God. But the truth is, every battle that we face, battles that we face on a daily basis, battles that are ongoing, irrespective of what kind of a battle it is and what battle it is, the truth is, this is not about you. You cannot assign God a post in your army. That is what Joshua was doing here. Asking, are you on my side or are you on the side of the enemy? You need to rethink your, your agenda. The battle belongs to God. It does not mean that you don't have to show up for the fight. It just means, ultimately, the victory that you see is not your victory. But because God has a purpose in you getting the victory. And if you see all the battles of life in this perspective, that the battle definitely becomes easier. Why? Because we know that we are going through this battle just because God wants us to go through this. So we have to turn up for the fight. We have to show up for the fight. But that victory is ultimately because God has a purpose. God has a purpose. You are not using God to get the victory. God is using you. You see that huge shift 
We often, we, we, our, our mindset is when we say, okay, we have to, to, to use God to get victory. But when it's, it, it's, it's a simple mindset that we need to just change, turn, turn, turn the table over and say, actually, God is using me in this battle. This is not my battle. If it becomes God's battle, then it becomes that God is using me in this battle. But if it is my battle, yeah, then I have to use God. And there is this, the, 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 the shift. You don't fight your enemy before you encounter God. This is a, a, a classic lesson that we can learn from this story. Don't ever fight your enemy before you encounter God. We hear people say this, we hear preachers preach it, we hear people talk about this, but the truth is, just ask yourself, how often we follow this? How often we tell ourselves, Yes, we need to encounter God before we go into any battle. And that is why Paul wrote, Paul in, 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 the, in the epistles, Paul is writing it very clearly and he says, this is, uh, I die daily. But he's saying that I have weaknesses. He's saying that every morning he's at the foot of the cross in the presence of God. Because only then victory is sure. Victory is sure. Operating from a position of strength and not strength. When you encounter God before you face the enemy, then you are operating from a position of strength and not strength. Am I right? That's how it is. Because you have already encountered God and told them this is what it is. And, and so you don't have to strain a fresh vision of a contemporary revolutionary understanding of God is what is I'm talking about. A fresh vision of a contemporary revolutionary understanding of God. Of who God is. Traditional people stay just the same contemporary understanding of that's all. They just want to be in the same um, mindset. They just want to have the same ways of doing things. And they believe that God only acts in, in, in certain ways. They say, oh, that is all what I, I, I will do. God is the same, but his methods change. His mannerism change. And he also changes his garments. And we have seen that all through the scriptures. We have seen that all through the scriptures. In spite of knowing it, when he does change his garment, and when he does appear in a different form, you don't recognize it. We don't recognize it. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 16. Uh, when you read Numbers, you will read through this particular passage where it says, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. And here the scripture is saying, Moses actually changed Joshua's name. You see the names that are mentioned there? His initial name meant he who saves or salvation. But Moses changed it to Joshua, which means God who saves, the Lord is salvation. Because this guy, he thought that he is the one who saves. He is the, the he's, it's all about him. The question I have for each of you and uh, found church of the fountain is can you see holy ground in the battlefield can you see holy ground in the battlefield that's one of the greatest lessons i've learned from my granddad because he would always share his life experiences and talk about how he found holy ground in the battlefield Seeing how seeing holy ground in a crisis is what separates greatness from mediocrity. Seeing this as an opportunity for God to reveal Himself. 
Take off your shoes, get rid of traditional mentalities. Storms of change will blow you away to a new direction. God will bring you out, God will deliver you. God will do wonders that people will not believe. They will not be able to believe that these are the wonders that, that God does. The situation you're dealing will come to pass. Joshua worshiped God. When he realized that he, was, he had questioned the wrong person, when he recognized the, the, the presence of dignity, the scripture goes on to say, in that same passage, the scripture goes on to say, he fell down and he worshipped God. He worshipped God. By worshipping God in the middle of the crisis, you change a situation into a sanctuary. Do you agree with me? Yes. By worshipping God in the middle of crisis, you change the situation into a sanctuary. And that's exactly what he did. When you worship God, God will give you a strategy. When you worship God, God will give you a strategy. Believe me, the scripture is saying that when you worship God, God will give you a strategy. Irrespective of what your situation is, Irrespective of what your problem is, irrespective of what you're fighting against, or irrespective of what your battle is, when you worship God, God will give you a strategy. Joshua was going for this fight. He recognized the presence of the divine. He fell down and he worshipped, and then God gave him a strategy. God said, yes, this is the strategy I'm giving you to win Jericho. And what was the strategy? Very simple. You walk and you shout. You see how, how simple life becomes when you have encountered God before you go and meet your enemy? You see how simple life gets when you worship God? It is all about worshiping God and that is why we are here. It is all about worshiping God. When you worship God, God will give you the strategy for your life, for success in your life, in, 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 in whatever aspect of, of, of life that you're going through, in whatever battle you are in, God will give you the strategy. And the strategy to bring a city as big as Jericho down was very simple. He just told Joshua, you walk and then you shout. You're kidding me. You're telling this warrior, this ever ready fighter, the guy who thinks that he is the best fighter ever. God is telling him, you put your sword down and you walk. Go and take a walk with all your men. Really? I just can't imagine what Joshua would have thought. Maybe the first day he went for this walk and then God said, go and take rest in your tent. And he did. And he's wondering like, next day again, go for a walk? Yeah, take his men and go for the walk. And again, the next day you go for a walk. Yeah, you walk. And then God says, on the last day, you just not, it's not only walking on the last day, but I also want you to shout. I also want you to shout. This is true. And this is true in our lives too. God's strategy is always simple. The Greek word walk doesn't mean to physically walk. It means to walk with a certain conduct, belief. Not only, not, not just physically, but to walk circumspectly. And we as Adventist Church, this is the walk that we should be walking today. We should be walking with a certain conduct, with a belief, with a backbone, with a spine. And with circumspectly we should be walking. And when we walk that walk, we will overcome every battle and any battle out there. And if it's people that we need to influence, we will influence them because God, that's God's strategy. And shout! God said, not only you walk, the final round that you're going, after you walk, I want you to shout. Shout because something is about to break. And that should be our mentality, irrespective of There will be times when you think, I've prayed about this all these years and no answer to my prayer, but keep this as your mentality when you say, I will pray again because something is about to break. 
And God can break every chain. God can break every difficulty. God can break every problem. You know, speaking of what you're going through, God can break it. And that should be our mindset. But the scripture says the, the strategy that God had for Joshua and his people was just walk and shout. Just walk and shout. May that be our strategy too. To walk circumspectly and to shout because something is going to break. Because ultimately the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. God bless you.